OK, so it's two minutes past 10, <clears throat> so we'll get going. Um, hi, everyone, and um, welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for our first of three one hour webinars on quality control in the serology laboratory. Uh, my name is Christopher and I am the group sales manager for AB Scientific and AB Molecular. For those of you that don't know who we are, um, AB Scientific was formed in 2014 and we supply products to the UK and Ireland from our offices in London and Dublin. Our clinical division comprises of a portfolio of products around third party quality control, assay verification, verification data processing, and interpretation covering all aspects and clinical disciplines across pathology. Today, I am uh, delighted to welcome Joe Vincini and Wayne Demek from the NRL, who will be discussing why is QC for serology different to the norm. Before we begin, I'd just like to uh, run through some housekeeping. The webinar itself is being recorded. And we and will be available to watch again from our website in the next um, few days. For the benefit of the viewers, everyone's microphones have been muted. If you do have a question which you wish to ask, then please feel free to pop it in the chat at any time. The chat can be accessed from the speech bubble at the top of your screen or bottom in the viewing through uh, if you're viewing through a browser. If you are on your phone, then honestly, I don't know where that is. Uh, but I'm sure you'll be able to find it. Uh, to improve um, <clears throat> your, um, once the presentations have started, um, if you can click the focus button from the menu, and that will ensure that the presentation is in full screen on the device that you're using for today's webinar. My colleague Aaron is managing the chat box, and at the end of the presentations, we will answer as many questions as possible. If you don't get managed, uh, if you don't manage to get through them, them all, then we will publish them on our website along with the recording of this webinar. So please do look out for an email in the next coming days with a link. If you would like to ask any questions privately, then please email events at abscientific.com and we will get back to you shortly. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Joe and Wayne who will present on quality in the serology lab and why QC for serology is different to the norm. So over to yourself, Wayne and Joe. Thank you very much, Christopher, um, for your introduction. Um, and uh, thank you very much also to AB Scientific for inviting uh, Joe and myself to uh, present in this series of lectures. Um, I'll be the one presenting today and Joe will be uh, following up in the next few weeks with the two other presentations. So I'm going to be your host today. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that which I live, um, the Wurundjeri people from the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So as Christopher said uh, today, we're going to talk about why QC for serology is different to the norm. And it's a, um, this lecture is, or, or presentation is really a foundation lecture. Um, Joe will follow up with um, two more lectures, which are going to be much more nitty gritty about um, QC in general, but this is really positioning the concepts that NRL has developed around QC over the last 10 years or so. So I saw some familiar faces, some, some familiar names as the um, people were being led in from the lobby. Um, but I'm guessing that most of you don't know who NRL is. We're the National Reference Laboratory in Australia. Uh, we're a WHO collaborating centre whose mission is to promote the quality of testing for infectious diseases globally. We're a not-for-profit organisation. Um, we're um, a scientific organisation. We are certified or accredited to a range of different international quality systems, um, into, including ISO 9001, 15189 as a medical testing laboratory, um, 17043 as an EQA provider, um, safety management, um, 
certification and also we're licensed to the Code of Good Manufacturing Practice because we do tissue, don tissue donor screening in our laboratory. We also um, provide a number of different services around um, promoting the quality of testing for infectious diseases. So QC is just one arm of the work that we do. Um, we do training and consultancy for um, particularly low middle income countries and in the Southeast Asian region in collaboration with WHO and Global Fund and FIND and, and Foundation Maria and a range of other groups. Um, we also have uh, external quality assessment schemes similar to the UK NEQAS um, that we provide, the quality control programs which we'll be talking about today. We do do pre and post market evaluations of test kits. So um, over the last year or so, we've evaluated around 60 or 70 different SARS-CoV-2 serology test kits for WHO, our local regulator, the TGA, and independently with our manufacturers. We provide a specialised testing service, um, screening and as tertiary reference laboratory. We have a small R&D team, a large biorepository of disease state plasma, which we use for our programs and for um, other uh, research. And we have actual, we have annual scientific workshops. We have one in Australia and um, we usually have um, an Asian workshop as well, COVID permitting. So I'm going to probably show my age here, but when I first started testing uh, in a serology lab as a young kid, um, top left hand corner, that's what we used to do. Hemagglutination inhibitions, complement fixations. Um, assays which used a property of an antibody antigen reaction. So what we were doing there is we were visualizing the antibody antigen reaction and that was either through an agglutination of red cells, the lysing of red cells or um, some precipitation or agglutination of latex particles or carbon particles or things like that. So that's where serology yeah, originated really and um, it wasn't until Abbott started providing some uh, automation. So we had the development of immunoassays back in the uh, you know, I suppose mid 80s and um, that started to become a little bit more automated with the, um, uh, the Abbott instruments and then we had the IMX and we sort of developed it and so over the years We've gone from essentially a boutique antibody testing um, process where we're actually visualizing that antigen antibody reaction to essentially a black box technology. So any of you guys who are under 30 you probably have never done a hemagglutination inhibition in your life and good luck to you. Um, so what's happened now is that immunoassays have become mainstream. So in blood transfusion services, uh, serology is done on high throughput instruments, you know, the PRISM or the Alinity or, or the Roche assays or, or those sort of um, instruments. And for infectious diseases in clinical laboratories, um, the testing has moved from um, a backbench in a microbiology lab through to the core lab. So in with the clinical chemistry assays, you know, the potassiums and ureas and the um, hormones and all the rest. Um, and in some labs, and I've been to a few of the big labs here in London, uh, where there's track systems that are taking samples up around the wall like a sushi train. Um, so it's not surprising that during that transition from the biological assays into these in instrument-based assays that are essentially controlled by clinical chemists that the methods that chemistry has used to control immunoassays and any other chemical testing has been applied to infectious diseases testing. But I'm hoping to convince you that there are significant differences between clinical chemistry and in, and in infectious diseases. And those methods of control that are traditional in clinical chemistry and work really well in clinical chemistry and not necessarily appropriate for infectious diseases serology. 
So I'd like to point out this um, letter that was written in response to an article that Joe and I and our colleague Marina um, wrote a few years ago. And um, the respondents said, and it's down the bottom, that serology assays are just another assay which follow the same laws as any other. And that's simply not true. And I'll spend the next 10, 15 minutes or so really trying to convince you that this is not true. And if you're very interested in this topic, uh, we present, we published just recently, um, end of the year in clinical micro -review reviews, which really puts all this out um, in, in a hopefully a logical way. Um, so that's a point of reference for you if you're interested. So here are um, some of the differences between clinical chemistry and infectious diseases serology. Um, I won't, I'll go through all of the, many of these in the presentation, um, so I won't um, dwell here on this slide, but you can see that there are a range of different um, differences that are uh, fundamentally different between clinical chemistry and infectious diseases serology. And I'll just make the point, when I talk about clinical chemistry, I'm talking about, you know, analytes. So um, glucose, potassium, urea, any um, uh, elemental um, uh, chemical that is being detected in a patient sample. So I always try, I use glucose as a, a good example, um, we, we, as an example of clinical chemistry analyte. We know that the chemistry of a glucose molecule is essentially invariable. So the, the glucose that you find in a, um, a jar that you buy from a, um, a chemical reagent company is essentially the same as the glucose that is passing through your body at the moment and in my body. And every body has the same glucose molecules floating around their, their body. And we can describe the chemical formula. We can actually probably create glucose in a test tube if we want to. And what we're doing is when we're testing for glucose, you know, from a blood sample, we're measuring the amount of the analyte, how much glucose is in that sample. But infectious diseases serology, we actually have a measure and which is very complex. And what we're measuring is the ability of that antibody or antibodies to bind to antigen or antigens. Um, and this is a measure of a functional biological activity which is called a type B quantity in metrology. And when we cannot make that traceable to an SI unit, because what we're measuring is not how many antibodies are floating around a person's body. We're measuring how well the antibodies in that patient can bind to the antigen that is on the solid phase of your test kit. And it's a really fundamental difference and really flows through some of the concepts around um, infectious diseases serology, in particular around QC. Another big difference is that there are multiple decision points in, in clinical chemistry. So a person can be hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic. So if we take a, a sample of all of the um, people in London and um, we plot their glucose levels, we're going to have essentially something that is approaching a normal curve. Obviously, we're not going to have the tails because they're going to be dead. Um, but we're going to have two clinical decision levels, one to say that a person's hypoglycemic and another to say the person's hyperglycemic. And generally, there's a dose response to um, that measurement. So as you increase the amount of glucose in the patient sample, the, the signal of your assay will increase proportionally. But the interesting thing, and this is really important for metrology, is that you can adjust for bias. So you can have a calibrator that is traceable to a certified reference material, um, so an international standard, and you can run that 
calibrate it as uh, in your assay. And if your results have got bias, then you can adjust for that bias in a clinical chemistry test. But you can't do that in infectious diseases serology. So with infectious diseases serology, you only have a single decision point. Really you're saying, does this person have antibodies or do they not have antibodies? And so when we look at the, um, the population of, of a particular area um, and look for antibodies to CMV or EBV or whatever, you're going to have two populations. You have the population that is negative and the population that is positive. And, and in a well-designed assay, those two populations are going to be separated and separated quite well, particularly in assays like HIV or hepatitis C, where the mean of, say, the positive population is going to be many signal, uh, sorry, many standard deviations away from the cutoff. And it's only in assays that are probably a lot less um, robust, so maybe a parvovirus B19 antibody test or a, a Borrelia test, where you're going to have some crossover. So you're going to have some false positives and false negatives. That's a really important point, And Joe will um, tease that out in his presentations in the following weeks. The other thing to note is that the analyte that we're measuring, the measurand, the antibodies, are highly complex. So again, we think about testing for HIV. We'll use that as the example. First of all, the antibodies circulating in a patient's um, in patient sample has got multiple classes, um, got IgGs, IgMs, um, subclasses. Um, they're going to be against different antigen targets. So if um, the take SARS-CoV-2. Um, you may have different antibody responses as to whether you had a wild type infection or whether you've been immunized with um, AstraZeneca or Pfizer or if you have had a booster um, or if you've been infected with a Delta virus or a Omicron virus. So different antigen targets, different, different antibody responses. And the antibodies in your patient sample may be free well, they may be complexed. Um, we have, and different individuals will in, create a different immune response even to the same challenge. So a vaccination for hepatitis B. We routinely see that some people mount a, a really good response or a very highly detectable response. And some people actually never even have a detectable response from that one vaccination, the same vaccination. Um, Assays are designed with different antigens and antibodies. I'll go into that in a minute. Um, and then the antibodies and antigens, oh, sorry, the antibodies used in the assay can be um, of different forms as well. And again, I will um, tease that out. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. Um, I've got an HIV assay. So what am I actually measuring? Um, I'm measuring antibodies to HIV um, of coming from multiple different subtypes. Um, we have antibodies to different antigens um, or diff yeah, different antigens, different um, peptides, which are immunogenic and can cause an antibody response. And those, each of those antibody responses are most likely going to be detectable in your immunoassay. So your immunoassay is not detecting one thing, it's detecting a whole multitude of different antibody antigen responses. We know that different viruses have different immunopeptides, um, different serotypes, um, and those serotypes, those antigens um, can, in the virus, can change over time. So just on the right hand side, these are um, a number of Western blots. Each of these are from an individual, different individuals who are antibody, HIV antibody positive. But you can see that their antibody responses are almost everyone is uniquely different um, to the other. Each of these will still 
have an HIV positive response when you test that sample in whichever assay that you use in your laboratory. But you have to note that the antibody response that is being um, that is creating that positive reaction is different. It's different for every individual. Um, the other thing too is that antibody, um, antibodies change over time. Um, you know, you uh, first infected with a, a new virus, um, you'll have a, a very immature response. Um, yeah. It'll be slow to start. It'll be not particularly um, uh, strong, um, but over time it will become more avid and um, the affinity will increase. Um, and um, gradually that antibody response will mature. And then it could decline again. And we, you know, there's a lot of conversation around this with SARS-CoV-2. You know, I hear quite often people saying, oh, your, your antibody response only lasts for, you know, a few weeks or a few months or, or whatever. But we have different antibody responses. You know, we have B cell memory immunity. Um, and so next time we're exposed to the same antigen, we'll kick in a really good response generally. And um, I think that can be evident by the fact that people who have been vaccinated are not sort of falling over like flies like they did um, in 2020. The other thing too is that with those different um, antibody uh, antigens, antibody antigen reactions um, across the different um, within the virus, these antibody and antigen reactions will first of all be quite variable, but also they will increase and decrease over over time. And we're all probably familiar with um, this graph, you know, where um, with a hepatitis B surface, uh, hepatitis B infection, you know, depending on whether your result, whether you eventually resolve or whether you go on to chronic infection, your antibody responses are going to change over the period of the course of your disease. So the idea that your antibody response, your HIV serology, your hepatitis C serology, your rubella serology um, is equal um, both in terms of assay to assay, but also from individual to individual is really a nonsense. We are measuring a highly complex um, element in a highly variable test system. So um, this is just to underline uh, the points that I made before. Again, on the right hand side, Western blots reading it from right to left. Um, you see the immune response of an individual um, over time. So these are sequential bleeds of the same individual and we're mapping the antibody response over time. And you can see that you know, initially you start with a P24 response um, and then gradually other polypeptide um, and antibodies to other polypeptides kick in and um, you know then some of them like p17 will decrease over time as well so again just really trying to point out that unlike glucose which is invariable we're measuring uh, quite a complex system and so we also then have to think about the assay that we're using um, so in any Im immunoassays that you're using irrespective of what they are based on the same concept you've got an antigen, uh, your target antigen bound to a solid phase, you're pa putting a patient sample in, that patient sample, if they have antibodies to that antigen on the solid phase will bind, then we use a conjugate, which is an anti-human conjugate. Now it might be an anti-human conjugate to just IgG or to just to IgM or to both or to IgA as well. Um, and then we have a chemical system, um, a substrate, which will develop a signal that you can use to both detect that antigen antibody reaction but also in some way measure how much antigen antibody binding there is but the antigen on your solid phase might be a whole virus it might be a disrupted virus it might be purified antigens it might be recombinant antigens or it could be a mixture of all of those depending on the assay and its design and the, the antibodies in the conjugate could be polyclonal, could come from any number of species, or it could be monoclonals looking for particular parts of that um, patient 
immunoglobulin. Um, they might, as I said, detect different subclasses or subclasses within your um, patient sample, or maybe just looking at different fragments um, of that antibody. And then the chemistry that we use to detect the signal. Um, yeah, if you're using micro to plate assays, which I'm I guess not many of you do. Um, you know, we have a color metric um, reaction, but with um, you know we can use immunofluorescence, or you know most of them in our can illuminescence of some sort. And the design of the assays could be you know, some rapid tests that we're using a lot of, um, you know, particularly in low middle income countries or at point of care. Um, but also we can have sandwich assays, reverse capture, or competitive inhibition assays. So again. Every element of this introduces a variable. So the idea that we're measuring the same analyte and that antibodies, serology antibodies, um, work the same way as any other um, test system is really a nonsense. So why is all this important, particularly in regards to QC? Um, well, first of all, um, test results are influenced by all of these things. They're, inter, inter, um, they're influenced by the antigens present on the organism, um, the measuran being tested. And when I talk about measuran, I'm talking about the whole complex of antibody antigen reactions, um, the biological immune response of the patient, the way the assays are designed and the way they're standardized. Um, and all of these factors do influence quality control. So we'll dig down a little bit around quality control and maybe have a, a think about what we know and what we think we know about QC. So the complexity of infectious diseases um, influences quality control systems, um, de de sorry, decisions throughout the history of quality control. So if you think about the introduction of QC as a concept. It was, um, it's a manufacturing concept. It's a way that we can minimize the amount of waste in manufacturing and, and standardize the output of whatever you're manufacturing. And that's been successfully applied to clinical chemistry. And there's been some general quality control principles that have been developed over the years. You know, in particular, you know, things like Westgard rules, which are universally used. Um, but also the complexity of infectious diseases, um, QC can influence um, the selection of QC materials. And, and Joe will probably be talking about that in the next um, lecture or two. Um, the complexity also um, in, um, in work uh, has an effect on the quality control programs. And that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, and also the, the guidelines that we use and um, some of the assumptions that underline the quality control practices that we have. So why do we run QC? We all know that assays have an inherent variation. We know that if we test a sample, whichever sample, um, you know, multiple times over different days on the same test system, we're going to get slightly different results. You know, we wouldn't be at all surprised if we get a numeric result, a signal to cut off value that's different from one day to the other. You know, we'd be very surprised if we get a different qualitative result that a positive turns negatives or vice versa. But if our sample to cut off value today is um, 10 and, and tomorrow it's 12, we wouldn't blink an eyelid because we know that there's inherent variation. And that variation comes from the different reagent lots. And, and we know as a fact that for infectious diseases, serology reagent lots are the most um, greatest cause of variation in your test system. And we'll tease that out over the next um, little while and in future lectures. The Variation also comes from the instruments and the equipment and it's the maintenance, um, the way that we calibrate, the things that people do, particularly in more manual assays, um, the storage and transport conditions of the reagents um, that we use, and also environmental conditions. So let's have a think about what, let's have a talk about what we think we know about QC. I'm gathering that 
most of you have some sort of a QC program, particularly for your most, um, you know, your more high risk analytes like HIV and hepatitis C. So we work on the premise that if we test the same sample over time, that will essentially get you know, different results, but they will form essentially a normal curve. And we know that um, you know 95% of those results will fall within um, mean plus or minus two standard deviations. And that, you know, outside of three standard deviations, that's an exceptionally um, unexpected result. And we use this principle um, to, uh, to monitor the, the QC results that we have and to flag any QC results that are unexpected or out of control. So we do do this and um, the traditional methods usually use mean plus or minus two standard deviations, sometimes three standard deviations. And um, one of the things that we don't ask ourselves is mean plus or minus two standard deviations of what data set? Because whichever data set you use, you're going to get a different range, aren't you? So if you look at the different um, professional guidelines that are around, there's not very many, to be honest. Um, there's the German really back standard and they suggest uh, 15 results to set your, your range. So 15 results, set your mean plus or minus two standard deviations, off you go. Public Health England, which essentially is a mirror of the CLSI guidelines, um, suggests 20 uh, data points. And um, the, the most recent CLSI guidelines in 2016 does sort of give a hint towards, you know, sometimes you might have to recalculate periodically. So this is any graphs that we show here. These are always real data. They're not cherry picked. They're, just generally representative of the data we see. We, we run a, an international QC program. We uh, have millions of data points that we can analyze. So this is, um, you know, just sort of helps indicate um, what we're talking about. So what we, this is essentially a year's worth of results testing um, a single sample on a, um, uh, every, every day or so. Um, we have on the, x-axis we have the day on the y-axis we have the sample to cut off value we see that there's variation over time um, and we see some dips and bumps we have the different reagent lots up the top and you can see the lines there and we can see some change with uh, the different reagent lots um, associated but if we calculate the mean plus or minus two standard deviations of this whole data set and um, we see that there's around, magically around five or about 95% of these results are outside that mean plus or minus two standard deviations. So that would give us a real level of comfort that, um, you know, we have a normal distribution and that the, um, the results uh, fall within that traditional approach of mean plus or minus two standard deviation. But if we take the first 20 data points and then um, we plot those, and that's this is the first 20 data points plotted on, a, on the graph. And we calculate the mean plus or minus two standard deviations of these first 20 data points, like the different standards tell us to do. And then we take that mean plus or minus two standard deviations and we overlay it with the year's worth of data. And so again, you can see the mean plus or minus two standard deviations of first 20 data points all fall within it, that's really good. But immediately, as soon as you start changing your reagents um, plot numbers, you start getting outliers. So if we were you to use Westgard rules for this or the CLSI guidelines or the UK guidelines, within a month, we're going to be in deep trouble. So I really actually wonder what you guys use um, because it can't be the way that is um, suggested in the UK guidelines but that's something that we can talk about. So we know, and we've published on this, um, that 15 or 20 data points uh, are not predictive of the future results for infectious diseases because there's too much reagent variation. And that is normal. That reagent lot to lot variation is normal. There's no assay 
that does not have that reagent lot to lot variation. And so, you know, we find that there's a fair bit of confusion as to how to, uh, how, how to manage this situation. So NRL developed a, a program called QConnect. Um, it is essentially, it's a, a multi, it's addressing a number of different issues. And I'll go into a couple of these um, and Joe will go into more later. Um, so we have um, a particular type of QC and we've worked very closely with um, Diamex um, to develop the Optitrol QCs um, to uh, facilitate the QConnect concept, which I'll, I'll explain. We have EDCNet, which is our um, QC monitoring system. Um, I'll go into some detail with that. We also can produce uncertainty and measurement reports. That's a whole different conversation to be had. Uh, Joe will talk you talk you through um, QC limits. I'll, I'll touch on that later in this presentation. And we also provide a whole lot of um, support to the customers. So just go touch on a little bit around each of the three main areas that I'm going to talk about today. So for the QC samples, we've worked, as I said, with Dimex in Germany um, to produce the Optitrol QCs. Each of these QCs have been optimized for different platforms. So QConnect, I'm sorry, Optitrol Blue, as an example, can be used on the Abbott Architect or the uh, Diasar Liaison. We have um, a, a different um, one, QConnect Red, that can be used on the ROSE systems, uh, QConnect um, uh, Orange on the Siemens systems, et cetera. And we have other um, QCs that can be used across all of the platforms like the Torch QCs. So the way that we go about this, and this is really important, is that we produce, or Dimex has produced, a large amount of stock material, which just has high um, antibody levels. And we use that same stock material every time that we create a new lot of um, QCs. So we have minimal lot to lot variation in our QC. So every QC is essentially um, a daughter of the same, um, same manufacturing lot. Um, and so we can have um, the same, we can, we can merge the results from one lot of QC to another. But also the QCs are stable over a long period of time. Um, they have a, a number of really nice features being color coded and barcoded, which I'm sure the AV scientific people will talk to you about. Um, when they come and visit. So knowing that we have these QCs and those QCs are essentially not tied to, but if you're using an Abbott Architect or a Roche Alexis, um, your each laboratory is using the same QC. And because there's minimal lot to lot of those uh, variation within those QCs, then we pool all of those data that people, are, um, uh, when they test the QCs, we collect that through EDCNet. Buying a QC is, um, is not the end point. You know, QC is a tool, it's not, not the end. Um, what you need is a way to um, collect the results and display those graphically, and then have acceptance rules that are, that are meaningful. And most importantly, you need to have a um, a way of um, reacting if those results are outside of the acceptance criteria that you're using. So um, the point is that if you're using a QC without being part of a peer group, really all you're doing is monitoring pr precision. You're looking at your variation within your laboratory over a period of time. But without a reference point, which is your peers, you really don't know whether you're whether you have any bias in your system. So if your system is running low or high uh, without a reference to um, other people using the same QC and assay combination, you really don't know whether um, you are having any problems or not. And this is what EDCNet is built to do. It's allowed, it's a way of collecting um, data um, from all of the different um, laboratories that are using the same QC assay combination, um, get, gets entered into EDCNet and each data point has, we, we know who was doing the testing, which instrument was that testing done, which assay 
um, lot number, which QC lot number. Um, and so each of that each of those elements are tied to each of the data entries into EDCNet. And that allows us to filter or to, um, to um, uh, trend each of those different um, elements within um, the database. We also have um, easy data entry and we um, have the ability to interface into your laboratory information system or your instruments or your middleware. Um, and we have automatic validation rules and, and be able to um, prompt you to if there is uh, any data in data entered that are outside those um, validation rules. And there's just a bit of a schematic. Um, we have multiple laboratories all testing the same assay QC combination. They enter their results into EDCNAT. A laboratory can look at their own results and but they can also compare their results with the summary of the results from all of the other labs and just a few graphs. This is sort of a Levi Jennings chart of, labor of um, data over time. This is flagging all of the different lot numbers in different colors, but we could also flag the different operators in different colors or the different uh, reagent, um, different instruments if there's multiple instruments in, in, in different colors. You can look at your results compared to everybody else. And so you can see whether you your results are similar to everyone or whether you have a bias, whether you're reading higher or lower to other laboratories. Um, and again, you can look at the same sort of thing in a different, different form and you can pull out your data in a graphical form. Each of these are exportable into either images or Word documents or to Excel spreadsheets. So just um, gradually finish, finish off talking about QConnect limits because really this is the crux of what we do. So back in 2014, Joe, Marina and myself um, published a way of determining um, quality control limits based on historical data. So if you think about this, you've got all of the um, assay one users entering data on the same QC. So we have this great big pool of data um, going into our EDC net. What that's doing, it's accounting for all of the variation, all of the normal variation that laboratories are experiencing, including the reagent variation. And um, we calculate the um, the variance but within and between the different QC lots. And we can use that to establish acceptable limits. Um, and that can be used to trigger um, investigations. So just sort of take you through a little bit of data here, um, just as some representative data. So this is um, Optitrol Blue on Abbott Architect. Um, so these are four different QC lots over time. And these are the results um, that we have entered, uh, that have been entered into EDCNet for each of these different lots. So, you know, 15, 16,000 results from lot number one, 7,000 uh, for lot number two and three, and 6,000 for lot number uh, four. I just sort of point out the mean, um, each of these means of these 15 or 7,000 results are almost identical. Um, so it just indicates a minimal lot to lot variation. So we can use the results of 35,000, 36,000 results of using QConnect Blue on the Abbott Architect. And it, with that information, we can say with a high level of confidence that if your result, if you're testing QConnect Blue on the Abbott Architect based on 35,000 results, your results should fall within 2 to 3.5. And that's our QConnect limits. I just sort of indicate this in a different way, same sort of um, method, um, different uh, one year's worth of data from the Abbott Architect, um, 71 different laboratories participating using 94 instruments, 77 different reagent lot numbers over that period of time. Um, in this example, we've got 18,000 results um, with using our QConnect limits. Um, two to 3.5. And if we look at this uh, on a graph, what we can see is those 18,000 results 
and your QConnect limits um, from you know, 2.1 to 3.5. And you can see that if your results are outside of that range, first of all, if your results are within that range, that is expected. You know, that, that, is, that should not cause any concern. You can just keep on doing your work. Whereas if um, your results do fall outside of that range, that's when you should start thinking that maybe you need to investigate. So again, Joe will go into this in much more detail in the next lecture. So just in conclusion, um, all assays have normal variation and it's expected that lot to lot variation is normal. The QC range must account for this variation. And if it doesn't, you're going to be wasting a whole lot of time investigating um, uh, outliers, which really are not outliers. The traditional methods do not account for this normal variation, and we strongly believe that using 15 to 20 data points is not predictive of future results, and that WestGuard rules are not really appropriate for infectious diseases. Again, we've published on this. We can provide you the papers, um, you know, really drilling down into this, and Joe will probably touch on it in his next uh, presentation. So the QConnect um, system uses historical data, a large amounts of historical data, which includes all of the normal variation. Um, we've published this on, on, um, on many occasions, um, validating this process. Um, and all of this is driven through EDCNet, which, you, which has the Q Connect limits inbuilt. So when you enter your results into the system, it will flag whether the results are outside of that Q Connect limit. Um, EDCNet also provides access to peer group data, um, and you know, we've got this um, system operating in many countries around the world. Um, and it is the only validated method for monitoring infectious diseases, QC. So I just finish up there um, just to introduce um, the two lectures that Joe will be giving us um, over the next um, month or so. Um, the next one will be talking about how does QC in the labo serology laboratory, how does this improve the quality of testing? And the final one will be expanding the boundaries, the QConnect limits and other methods for identifying variation. So those uh, upcoming lectures that um, hopefully you can register for and, and enjoy. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Wayne, for that. Um, really do appreciate your time and, and the insight that you've been able to give today for everyone that's attended. Um, now, we have obviously come to the end of this uh, presentation time, uh, so uh, we do have a little bit of time remaining to cover some of the questions that have been come, coming in the chat function during the presentation. Um, in addition to the, the speakers, obviously, we do have other people on hand that might be able to answer some of the questions, but if I could maybe hand over to Aaron, please, uh, for you to ask the first question that's come through the chat box. No probs. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> I guess the first two questions kind of merge into one, Wayne. So um, the first question is uh, whether all or which Westgard rules will be applicable in the serology quality control scope. Um, and the second question is surely Westgard rules are best. Everyone in the UK uses them and the guidelines say they should be used. Yeah. Um... I suppose I will answer that with uh, this way. Have a think about the numbers of publications you've um, read where it's applied Westgard rules to QC. Um, I'm guessing it won't, will be zero. I know that there's probably three, I think over the last two decades. Um, and each of those publications outside of the NRL publications um, were done on small data sets um, with very few lot to lot um, assay variation. Oh, sorry, with, with, diff with no lot changes. So they've taken one lot of reagent and they've applied West Guard rules around that. And they said, yeah, look, this works. What they haven't done is um, continued on and used um, 
the, the same rules over a long period of time where there's multiple changes of reagent lot. And I would guarantee that they come unstuck. So yes, the UK guidelines do say that you should use West guard rules and use mean plus or minus two standard deviation. I know for a fact that that doesn't work. So I'd be really interested in hearing feedback from your um, you know, the people on this um, call as to what they do to get around it because um, they can't be using the guidelines as I've written because they don't work. If you don't mind, if I can add Please. a little bit to that, just um, just uh, bear in mind that what drives the um, implementation of any type of uh, assessment of a QC result is typically what the regulators want. And in, in particular the UK, um, that's UCAS. And so um, there is this pretty much broad understanding across all the laboratories that it's not what's best for your laboratory, it's what you need to present to UCAS. Now, UCAS are not the experts of your laboratory, you are. And, and UCAS um, really looks at what you're doing in your laboratory and the standard that you're assessing your laboratory to says that you must be confident of the quality of your laboratory, oh. not UCAS. And so I think what gets confused there is that we, we feel that the, the, the regulatory bodies understand what is required of QC better than we do as the laboratory scientists, and they don't. I can tell you that I presented to UCAS last year, and many of the concepts that we have come up with, they hadn't even ever thought of before. And most of the times they're assessing our laboratories on the paradigms that have been developed on, on quantitative testing, such as Westcard rules, because that is a standard that is used against Westcard, uh, against qu quantitative data. And in many cases, written and and assessed by people who work in clinical chemistry. And it's the serology specialists who have never understood how to implement those in a serology laboratory and have never made it um, work. They don't understand how to make it work. And it never fits in. You test a, a sample for 20, 30, 40, 50 times, change the reagent lot and all of a sudden it never works again. So how do you reassess how that's going to work in your laboratory. In many cases, it doesn't work. And we, we need to stop this cycle of saying, we need to make a system that wasn't designed for us in the serology laboratory and make it work. So saying that if you ask me the question, which Westgard rule we should use in serology, which is the best one, I would say none of them. None of them were designed for us and none of them work. We have to find a different system. Now, I'm not saying ours is the best system, but it really is a step in the direction that makes us think of an alternative, an alternative method that is more suited to our system using historical data to establish what that range should be. Now, why do we need a, a system that triggers whether there is a result that is up or down? When we think about the, the, the slide that Wayne showed us with two peaks for serology, those peaks don't represent an amount or a quantity. And if you think what's happening in chemistry with the results of a, of a population showing what is possible in chemistry, possible in a population and a test, in, test system will be able to display, then you can apply a clinical decision point. Now, what we will hear from um, people who test is saying, well, there's also clinical decision points in a serology test, and we must have a serology result that is uh, from a QC that must be close to that clinical decision point. Well, I challenge you what that clinical decision point is in the assay, because the way the assays have been designed is to separate how an assay responds to no antibodies and how an assay responds to antibodies. And those peaks don't represent an amount. So the challenge is to convince yourself and understand that those results that are close to the cutoff don't represent potentially always early infections or low amounts of antibody. They are just telling you that is the way that the system responds. But if you look at it qualitatively, you would, you would most likely find that an assay will still tell you that a sample is positive and a sample is negative if they truly are that way. 
So now we can discuss. Thanks, Joe. Um, so the next question, Wayne, is um, I'd like to know your standpoint on matrix effects. As often seen in the past, especially heterogeneous assays in infectious disease are streamlined for high performance in human samples. Due to shortage of materials or difficulty sourcing, control samples are often diluted, which leads to not so much human sample. You're on mute, Wayne. Yeah, that's never been done before. Um, yeah, so absolutely matrix effects can um, influence your QC. And so the, the, the couple of points. So the um, the Dimex controls, um, you know, we like I said, we work very closely with Dimex in the manufacture, the, the design and manufacture of those controls. They, one of the great advantages of Dimex is that they have a partner company called Biomex, which is a plasma um, collection center. Um, so they are able to acquire large volumes of um, both normal human plasma, but also um, uh, disease state plasma. Um, and they're actually even able to collect large volumes, yeah, plasmapheresis volumes, from um, the same individual over multiple periods. So they can collect large volumes of um, the, the materials that we use. So we only, so the, the lack of um, availability of matrix is never a problem for, for Diamex because they've got literally freezers full uh, of um, the, the matrix, the human plasma. Um, but we only use real human plasma. It's, there's no buffer, there's no bovine serum albumin, which you know some of the other QC manufacturers I know use. Um, and if you're diluting sample down, particularly if you're using a non-human based dilution, uh, first of all, I'd really, um, I'd really not support or um, encourage using um, a diluting um, a product, which is essentially an IVD. So the minute that you take um, an IVD, whether it's a Dimex control or a Biorad control or um, Seracare control, and you dilute that down, that is no longer an IVD. And that is now an in-house um, IVD uh, under Australian regulations. It is, I'm not sure about the UK regulations, but it's no longer that manufacturer's QC and should not ever be thought of um, as that. And, and I would really recommend against manipulating a QC. They've been developed and designed for a particular purpose and um, it shouldn't be used because there is uh, matrix effects. And if you do manipulate that QC, then um, you are opening yourself up to situations which you'll have to troubleshoot. Thanks, Wayne. Um, next up is how the measurement of uncertainty reports delivered and can they be generated per lab instrument or site? Yeah, so within EVZ net, and really there's a, the whole, there's a whole story about uncertainty measurement, which we, um, you know, I, I haven't touched on and I don't think we're looking at in these next series of lectures, but maybe it's something we could look at adding as a, another, another lecture. Um, so NRL has developed um, a way of calculating uncertainty measurement using both imprecision and bias. Um, so anyone can measure the imprecision of their assays um, by just taking all their QC results and measuring the CV or the SD and, and reporting that. And that's sort of fine. Um, but what you're not measuring is bias. So because we have large numbers of laboratories testing large numbers of results, uh, we can look at the mean of your laboratory and compare that mean of your laboratory against the mean of everybody else. Um, and then that gives you a sense of bias. So what we do is we um, have a mathematical way of combining your imprecision and your bias to um, report an uncertainty measurement. And what that's all built into EDCNet. So what you can do is go into EDCNet and you can 
generate a report on your uncertainty of measurement uh, for each um, for each assay that you use that you've entered results for, and it's automatic. And and each instrument as well, so you can break it down to instrument if you wish. Yep. Thank you. Um, there's a question around access and EDC net, which um, I'll follow up on outside of the webinar. Um, so Sheree, that's from you at Princess Alexandra. So um, you guys are already on there, so I'll follow up with you afterwards and discuss that. Um, so the next question is, is anything wrong with using pooled patient samples for QC? Well, um, there are a number of possible issues with that. Um, first of all, you know, we, we're very much involved with the manufacturing of QCs and, uh, and we know how hard it is to keep that in control. You know, the, the development of QCs is a, an art form in itself and um, it it's, would be surprising to those that are not involved in understanding what goes into both the design and the development and the manufacture of QCs lot after lot. So if you're looking to become a QC manufacturer by using cool patient samples, you need to measure or, or determine your, first of all, your raw material, um, access to raw material. So how long is that cool patient sample going to last? Is it going to last you? few weeks, a few months, a few years, um, how are you going to store it? What's the homogeneity of that storage? What's the stability of the samples? Um, you know, how do you know that that sample is not um, changing over time? All of that is done for the QCs that you purchase as an IBD. If you do pool patient samples, what you are potentially doing is introducing another source of variation which is not coming from your test system. The whole idea of creating really good QCs is those QCs are not introducing variation or any variation that they introduce is minimal to your test system. Pool patient samples, um, different story. If you're really good at it, probably fine. But you know, if you if you're a blood, you know, if you've got access to large volumes of samples, and you know you can have the wherewithal to ensure homogeneity and stability and uh, continuity, then it's you know, possibly fine. But again, you know, what's your matrix that you're going to dilute it down in? How do you, how have you validated that? So it opens up a whole lot of questions. Um, it's not as easy as it seems. It's much cheaper than a commercial QC, but sometimes you get what you pay for. It also comes down to um, how they're viewed by regulatory bodies. So if they are considered to be IVDs, I know that with the European IVDD, it was a lot more flexible in, in using in-house made uh, controls and patient samples, pool patient samples. In Australia, um, we followed more closely the recommendations of the what was the G uh, GHTF and, and now the IMDRF. Um, and I think the new IVD regulations in Europe will follow more closely the way we have gone and that it makes it very difficult for you to have an in-house IVD even if it's just QC materials. So it, it means that you need to essentially um, comply with what the what the manufacturers have for a commercially available IVD and still show the, the, the documentation around the the way that that in-house pool patient sample, which is an in-house IVD essentially, and how that performs and how that's monitored and how that's guaranteed to be working like a commercially available QC is in the first place. So it would be, you know, something that, you know, I know that some, in many cases, you need to use a pool patient sample because there's nothing else, but especially in the HIV BC area where there's an abundance of materials available, it'll become more and more difficult to, for people to justify using something that, there is something commercially available in the first place. That's a really good point too. Um, the interpretation of the IVDR in regards to QC makes the QC um, at the same level as the assay that it's going to be used on. So if you've got an HIV assay, um, it becomes a, your QC becomes a class D assay. 
uh, class D IVD. Where in Australia that's different, you know, we, we haven't taken such a stringent um, interpretation of the regulations. Um, so that, that'll be an additional barrier. And I'm not sure, first of all, I'm not sure whether the UK is following the IVDR. That's, that's a, the first question. But secondly, um, whether there's going to be some availability of in-house assays for under the IBDR and um, how that's going to be applied. It's been applied, you know, it's been quite varied in Australia. It's it's migrated over time depending on, because the initial way that it was applied was very stringent and that was really not workable. Um, and so it'll be interesting to, to watch this space, what, what it might look like for particularly in-house QCs, uh, oh sorry, full patient samples, particularly for high-risk um, analytes. Thanks, Wayne. Um, just um, conscious of time constraints, so we're, we'll do this as a final question, um, but what we will do is answer all of the questions that have been um, posted on a kind of Q&A sheet that will be posted on our website. So all of the questions will be answered, it's just obviously timing wise. Um, so I guess the last um, the last one to ask is, do you think optotrol controls can be used instead of uh, controls provided by instrument manufacturers? No, um, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, uh, no, full stop. Um, so they serve different purposes, and this is a really important um, concept, and one that again differentiates infectious diseases serology from clinical chemistry. They, in clinical chemistry, your QC is essentially um, essentially a calibrator. It's it's generally traceable to an international standard, it has an assigned value. Um, it's there to essentially calibrate your assay. Whereas with the infectious diseases testing, um, whether irrespective of the manufacturer, the QCs that are provided um, are there to validate that test run or that um, period of time that you're testing. So you have your kick controls, your positives and negatives, and you run those and they, the package insert will say that your your controls that are provided by the manufacturer need to be within this particular range um, for your test to be valid. And that is part of the IFU, that's part of your legal obligation when you're testing that assay. An external QC, like the Optitrol QC, Again, we should we feel that that shouldn't necessarily be used to um, to control your assay. That shouldn't be used to validate your assay. What that's doing, it's monitoring variation over time. It is just telling you is your assay producing the results on that same sample tested over a period of time um, within a range of variability that is acceptable and. Uh, external QC doesn't validate that test run on the day. What it's doing is giving you a sense of continuity over a long period of time. And that's why that minimal lot to lot variation is so super important that you can run an Optitrol Blue um, and the Optitrol Blue that you ran two years ago should be reacting exactly the same as the Optitrol Blue that you run today. Um, because it's essentially built from the same materials, same dilution. So what it's doing, it's, it's looking at your variability over time. Um, it's giving you a different measure. Um, so yeah, absolutely, you should always run your kick controls. Um, the external controls are there to monitor over time. Your kick controls can't do that because the kick controls will change and they'll change from you know, lot to lot, uh, their, their reactivity, because you know what, they, they're not designed to be the same every every lot. They're just, they're designed to be positive or to be negative. Uh, whereas a, a really well controlled, well designed QC is supposed to be the same over a long period of time. Just add a, a one, one point to that, and that is that uh, a lot of the confusion around whether you can subs, uh, substitute a Kit control with a, a QC 
uh, arises because the standard 15189 does actually say you can replace a kit control with a QC. And that is in many cases, or you could use them when there are no kit controls available. In many cases, that is because most of the, the, the chemistry assays may not come with kit controls in the first place. And so you would use a third party control to, to control or quality control the run or the the results that you are achieving but in in as wayne had mentioned in 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 the infectious diseases assays in particular in serology the kit controls are all present in the assays and they are there to validate the run and the qc is not there to validate a run or to act as a go no go it is there to monitor your variation as Wayne said and and I'll probably expand a little bit more on that on why we would want to monitor variation and why that is important rather than saying oh this result is extremely low I need to fail my run um, and try to expand on those concepts in in the probably the third presentation so that's great. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you, Wayne, for um, answering those questions. As Aaron mentioned, um, any question that we haven't been able to answer or those that we have uh, will be published as a news article on our website. Uh, so we've captured all the questions that have come through and really appreciate everyone's engagement in today's um, Q&A session. Um, as I say, just from our side, you know, thank you again for attending our first of, of three webinars on quality control in the serology laboratory. Um, as stated in the uh, chat function, uh, the second event has been scheduled to be delivered on Tuesday, the 8th of March, again at 10 a.m. UK time, um, which I'm sure the guys at the NRL are, uh, are looking forward to. Uh, the AB scientific team will, of course, follow up with all the attendees on today's webinar with an invitation to the event in March, uh, which uh, this time will be delivered by Joe Vincini who is the QC services manager at the NRL uh, on how does it uh, um, improve quality testing. We really do hope that you've enjoyed today's presentation and found it useful. Thank you, Wayne, um, for presenting. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this for us. We will email a link to the recording in the next couple of days, so please keep an eye out on that. And if anyone would like any further information on, on the NRL solution, the Optrol um, QC range from Dimex, or the EDC net software, then please feel free to email us at info at abscientific.com or visit our website abscientific.com. Finally, I'd just like to let everyone know that AB Scientific will be attending the IBMS Congress in Birmingham in March. Please feel free to come and visit our stand number 713 and we'd be very happy to host you over tea, coffee, beer or wine to discuss all things third party quality control and maybe explore some of our new products which we are launching in rapid clinical diagnostics and biomarkers for emergency care. Thank you again for everyone attending and I hope that you have a great day.